Thank you for watching or downloading this sermon. We start a new series in a Belgic Confession. In this series, we seek to summarize the doctrines in Scripture as summarized in a Belgic Confession. This confession is written in 1561 to demonstrate that the Reformed Church is not a sectarian group, but a church that is in line with the ecumenical councils. We hope that you will be edified through this series as we lay out what our church believes. Well, this article continues with the doctrine of the Trinity and our understanding of the Trinity. Remember, we talked about the Trinity last time in two um, technical words or fancy words, however you want to put it, where we talked about studying God and his being from eternity. Uh, we say ontological, it just means the study of being, the study of God and who he is. And then we talked about how the Trinity functions in time, uh, that there's different works ascribed to each person. Now, this doctrine of the Trinity, no doubt, is something that is rather complicated. It's uh, something that I don't think anyone fully comprehends how God is one God in three persons. It makes more sense for us to see God as three persons or maybe one God in three different expressions. Uh, but that's not how God reveals himself. And so this is one of those things that when you hear the word of God, uh, we're called to embrace the testimony of the Lord. And so what exactly is this testimony and, and, and why is this so significant? As we consider this, we'll see first the testimony of God and then uh, unpacking more of what we mean by the three persons. So as we continue with the doctrine of the Trinity, uh, we have to understand on one hand, we obviously don't have time to get into all the comprehensive debates of this doctrine. I think uh, this, these articles in the Belgic Confession, you could preach weeks on these articles with all the technical thing, things that it mentions, but I'm going to try and summarize it to the best of my ability. And so notice that when the Belgic Confession lists a testimony, again, dealing with scripture, the testimony of scripture, and it lists this testimony, it lists a, a, some proof text where it tells us first, Genesis 1.26, the creation of man, uh, where you have the Lord saying, let us make man in our image. And so it's saying from scripture, we have this testimony. Uh, we have the baptism of Christ in Matthew 3.17, uh, where you have the Father pronouncing the goodness of the Son, the success of the Son, the Son being baptized and the Holy Spirit descending. We have the Great Commission, which is the basis for us baptizing in the name of the Trinitarian God. And then one of the passages I wanted to look at this evening, uh, 1 John 5, verse 7, not an easy verse to understand uh, where we get the doctrine of the Trinity from this. But also, when we look at this doctrine in the Belgic Confession, I appreciate how Guido de Bray starts with the scripture and says, here are the scripture texts we see says this isn't intended to be comprehensive. He says there's far more text in scripture, but Guido de Bray is basically saying to uh, Philip II or the Roman Catholic Church, these are the texts we seem the most persuasive. But he goes on and he grants that, uh, I love how he writes that this doctrine surpasses human understanding. I mean, that's the understatement of the century. It's, it, it does far more than surpass our understanding, but it's it's one of the things that I think we need to take to heart in the Belgic and in uh, our confessional tradition that this is not something easy to understand. Uh, so when somebody asks you and pushes you in the doctrine of the Trinity, uh, you can say, yes, this is one of those things. We have to look at scripture, see what scripture says. I don't fully understand it, but at the end of the day, do we really want a God that we can fully understand or, or fully define in terms of our human limitations. I mean, this is part of what puts us in awe of our God, that uh, he is a God who has created us, a God who is interested in us, a God who has redeemed us, which is something that should ultimately overwhelm us. And the Belgic Confession, as it goes on, talks about these works of the persons. The Father um, is a creator. The Son is the one who's saved. The Holy Spirit's a sanctifier. Uh, so as we mentioned last time, there's a general sense, Father, creator, the one who calls his elect, the son is a means of creation, the means of redemption, the Holy Spirit is the application of that redemption and the breath of life. Now, 
The Belgic goes on and lists a whole bunch of names, and we're probably not going to remember all these names, but it's just to kind of walk through uh, some of the ways that people have looked at the testimony of Scripture and have misunderstood the doctrine of the Trinity. So just trying to go through these names real quickly here. Uh, there's Marcion, a second century heretic. Uh, basically, Marcion believed there's a God of the Old Testament who's very mean, very judgmental, very vindictive, uh, very rigorous. And then there's a gracious God of the New Testament. Uh, basically, he elevated uh, Satan to the level of God. So there's two warring gods that work out in history. This obviously is not what Scripture uh, teaches already at the opening of Scriptures. When the Lord enters into the Garden of Eden, he calls Adam and Eve to account. He doesn't really have to wrestle all that much with Satan. He says, I will divide the human race and I will trample you. Uh, so right there, you see this is not true. Uh, Manes or Mani or the Manichaeans, uh, different translations of the Belgic Confession will list all those names. And what this means is that there's uh, these equal forces of light and darkness. Uh, basically, again, it's elevating Satan up to the, the being of God, not really seeing God as the ultimate sovereign one. You have Praxius or Sibelius. Basically, God is one God, but he expresses himself in three uh, different modes. And so this is what you may hear of modalism is another way of saying this. So there's God who's one God, but he might sometimes speak of himself as a father and sometimes speak of himself as a son and speak of himself as a spirit. Uh, this obviously, when we look at the baptism of Christ, presents a pretty big problem for this teaching. Uh, this is not at all what God presents about himself, and this is why we have deemed it a heresy. Uh, when we look at Paul of Samosota, or Samosodians, or however the translation is, uh, this is a teaching that Jesus is a mere man. And so the Father has created him in a very special way, has looked upon this, this son or this man and said this man is, is an incredible man, a very good man, a man who can fulfill my mandates and, and my law. And so the Lord then adopts this son, says this son will be my son and he will do my mission. And so obviously this is a problem because this is denying that Christ is from all eternity. It's saying that Christ is merely a very good man with at best a special endowment of the Holy Spirit uh, to do the will of the Father, but he's not the God-man. So again, if Christ is not God, he cannot take an eternal punishment. If he's not truly man, uh, then the creature that's offended God has not had that punishment uh, taken in their place. So obviously this is a big problem. Uh, because Christ becomes some sort of a hybrid. He's sort of a superman, but not really God and not really man. He becomes a special creation. Arius is the one that we talked about last time. Uh, this is where uh, basically Jehovah Witnesses still believe this, that Christ is a creation before the creation. So he's the first creation, a special son, a really supreme son, uh, higher than human beings, probably able to redeem, but not really God and not really man. And so again, Christ being the first creation, not being the second person of the Trinity from all eternity. And so when you understand these heresies, and I call them to your attention, again, I don't expect you to know all of them. Basically, when you look at this, well, what's the problem? Well, the problem is it's denying that God is one God in three persons. So he's either one God now, some may say three persons, there's tritheism, but it's also by and large denying that Christ is a God-man. And so this is obviously something that's difficult for us to understand. When we start getting overly creative in trying to resolve this, this is where we fall into our problems. Uh, this is where, again, it's that reminder that we just need to embrace what the Lord says to us, what he reveals, and say that this is true. Now, in terms of the ecumenical creeds that it cites. Again, we want to tell the Roman Catholic Church, hey, we're not radicals, we're not trying to step out of the tradition and say this doesn't matter. And so the three creeds that are cited are the Nicene Creed, Council of Nicaea 325, uh, we have the Apostles' Creed, where again, we see that it's just summarizing the doctrine of the Apostles, 
don't really know who wrote it. Tradition came down that the apostles wrote it, uh, but we don't really know if that's fundamentally true. Uh, we just see it as summarizing the doctrine of the apostles. And then the Athanasian Creed, uh, people have credited that to being Athanasius who wrote it. That's why it's the Athanasian Creed. Uh, but really, that's not likely because this creed comes into existence far after Athanasius walked this earth. Whatever the case, uh, those are the three creeds we hold to. Now, in terms of who we are and where do we orient ourselves, notice how the Belgic Confession uh, bears witness to this testimony. We have the scriptures, we have the tradition, and we have the creeds. And that's what the Belgic Confession desires for us to understand. Uh, that we're not a bunch of mavericks just trying to reinterpret the scriptures. We take the scriptures seriously. Uh, we also take uh, the wisdom that has gone before us in the church. We take the ecumenical creed seriously. And we also take um, these councils serious that have gone before us and, and what they say. Again, we compare them to the scriptures and we see what they say. So now... Getting into the nature of why does a, the Belgic appeal uh, to 1 John 5? This is not a passage that uh, we can intuit the Trinity from easily because uh, you only have basically the spirit, the water, and the blood bearing witness to the testimony. So when, when you hear that, you say, well, then does that mean that the spirit, the blood, um, the spirit and the blood and the water are, are the Trinity? Or are these the persons of the Trinity? Is that what the Belgic is trying to communicate? Well, I think we need to understand why John writes to this church. Uh, it seems that he's writing to a church that struggles with morality and how we live in Christ. Probably some sort of a pre-Gnostic belief coming in. It seems that even when we look at chapter 5, uh, that Jesus is the Christ, has been born of God, Everyone who loves the Father loves those who have been born of him. Uh, going on when he's talking about Christ and who Christ is, uh, that Jesus is the Son of God, etc., etc. So it seems what John is driving home is the significance of Christ being from eternity, being the Son of God, not by creation, but also the one who is the incarnate Word of God. And so it seems this church is having some difficulty grasping uh, the reality of that truth. And again, we think back to these Trinitarian heretics. What do they deny? Well, they either deny that God is one God in three persons, or they deny that Christ is a valid person of the Trinity. Uh, he may be adopted in. He may have been created to be a member of the Trinity, according to the heretics. But they don't see Christ as being from all eternity, which is what we teach as an Orthodox church. And so in terms of this orthodoxy, how do, we, how do we get there? What is John telling us? When he talks about this water and the blood, talks about Jesus Christ, you know, verse 6, talk about these three that testify uh, as we go on, that we have the Spirit is the one who testifies, these three that testify, verse 7, Spirit and the water, the blood, these three agree, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You, you read that and say, what is John talking about? Uh, this is not something that's very easy to understand. Uh, is he drawing some sort of analogy in the Trinitarian persons with spirit, water, and blood? But then he's talking about Christ and Christ's significance. Uh, what does that mean? Well, what does he mean by all this? Well, I think the first thing we need to understand to see what John is getting at is what does testify mean? What does testify, testimony mean throughout these verses? We have 1 John 1, verse 2, where John, as he writes this letter, he speaks of the testimony, the eternal life, uh, the testimony of Christ that's manifested in Christ. So it's not something that's merely subjective that uh, we believe, and therefore there's a testimony because people believe this truth to be, truth to be true. Rather, it's, there's a testimony about Christ and Christ is confirming that testimony. We go on to 1 John 4, verse 14. The testimony that the Father has sent the Son. Again, this is not some sort of subjective reality. It's not something that you say, okay, well, there's some talk about some Christ that was sent. I believe it to be true, and because I believe it to be true, then it's true. 
but it's rather the father, as he's working out his plan of redemption, sends the son. The sending of the son is testifying to this truth. 1 John 5, verse 10, uh, we believe, and then there's the testimony as we find in terms of this text. And so we believe in the Son of God, and we're believing in the testimony in himself. Again, 1 John 5, verse 10 is not saying that because we believe the testimony that it's true. It's actually the other way around. There's a testimony, and then we come to believe through the testimony. Now, this is an important thing to understand, because what John is teaching us, first and foremost, is that this testimony that is given to us is this testimony from the apostles, from the prophets. It's this testimony, the canonical word. And so if this testimony is merely our faith, uh, as some may try to, to put that into the text, it becomes a problem. Because it's a problem, meaning that God is only God because I believe God to be God. And so God and his existence only continues as long as we believe or I believe or one person believes in the living God. Well, the reality is it doesn't matter if anyone believes the testimony. It doesn't matter if, if people deny the testimony. God is still God. Now, obviously, that's going to become a problem if we say it's, it's, um, it doesn't matter if nobody believes it because God has decreed that a certain amount of people will come to faith and they will embrace Christ. So now after God says that, now people have to believe it. But again, that's the testimony. The point I'm making is that God is not God because he has a people. God is God. God is content in God. God is who he is. We do not make God who he is. God makes us who we are. And so when we take this testimony, we can't take this testimony as merely a subjective testimony of faith. It's a testimony of what God has done outside of us. It's testifying to his promises. So when the Spirit bears witness through this testimony, what is John telling us? John is telling us we come to believe because we have heard the testimony of Christ. We have heard the gospel. As we have heard the gospel, the Spirit testifies within us that this gospel message is true. And as this gospel message is true, we take hold of Christ by faith. And so it's again that understanding of the objective uh, tradition of the prophets and the apostles that come to us. The prophets have made a promise. Christ is a confirmation of that promise. And as Christ is a confirmation of that promise, we know that this word is true. And so how do we come to faith? Well, the Spirit's bearing testimony to the truthfulness of the testimony that God has given through the prophets and the apostles. It's also the Spirit who's working through the prophets and the apostles to write these words. And so the Spirit then in this testimony is not merely our test of testimony of faith. It's a testimony that what the God has promised to do is being manifested. So you take the words of the gospel, and the words of the gospel are being manifested. So now, us coming to faith actually gives credibility to this testimony. Because the Lord says, I will save a people unto myself. So as the Lord does this, it's testifying that the work of Christ is indeed valid work that accomplishes its goal. So in terms of this testimony, we understand what the Belgic is saying. We believe the testimonies of Scripture. That's what John's laying out here in 1 John 5. We need to believe the testimonies of what God has said about this Christ and about himself and what he has revealed. And what it also means is that as we come to believe, it's a spirit that's working within us. So we read these words and say, yes, I believe these words are true. May I walk in accordance with these words. May I bring glory to my God as his, as his servant. And so then as we understand this testimony, what about the three persons? Because we still have uh, that water, the blood, Jesus Christ, the spirit. <clears throat> what, what does all this mean? How does it fit together? So in terms of, of this Trinitarian understanding, we need to be careful in trying to hammer the Trinity into this threefold statement. That's not what John's trying to do. He's not trying to teach us that reality. And so we may wonder then, well, 
Why would we use this text? Well, John's doing something rather profound. When he talks about the water and the blood, he's speaking of something significant about Christ's mission. Now, some take the water to be our initiation into the Christian life through our baptism. Uh, others take the, that as being our initiation and the blood being the Lord's Supper and tied to the particular uh, manifestation of this to the sacrament. I don't think that's necessarily way out in left field, but it misses the point of the text. John is not speaking of a testimony that exists in a subjective sense, in the sense that I believe God is real, and because I believe God is real, therefore God is real. The reality is what John has said is, no, God is real. He's testified to who he is. Whether you believe it or not, that's inconsequential in terms of God. God is God. Now, it's better to believe the testimony because when he comes again, like we heard this morning, that's going to be a very bad day if you don't believe the testimony of the scriptures. There's no hope. But when you believe the testimony, you have life. But again, it's the testimony of the gospel and what God has revealed of Christ. This water in the blood, again, I don't think we want to take this in the subjective sense, in the sense of the application of the sacraments or the partaking of the sacraments. Uh, this isn't about me believing it's real because I have been baptized or me believing it's real because I've had the Lord's Supper. Now, I, I don't think that's necessarily wrong. I mean, the Lord's Supper certainly testifies to the reality of this, and baptism testifies to the reality of this. But I think John is doing something more. When he's talking about the water and the blood, where do we see the significance of this water? Well, he's telling us about the coming of Jesus Christ. And he's referring to the baptism of Christ. It is Christ who has come by the water. So now this isn't referring to his uh, taking on the flesh and being born of the Virgin Mary. Uh, because when we find this, John, when he uses this language, he's talking about it in terms of the advent of Christ or the advent or the coming of the Messiah. Second John 7, for example. There are those who deny the coming of Jesus Christ which means there are those who say, ah, this Christ wasn't really the Christ. We have, excuse me, 1 John 4, verse 2. It is Christ who has come. It's referring to his entrance into history when Christ takes on the flesh. So getting back then to this water and Christ coming by the water, this is testifying to the public advent when Christ is baptized. So we talk about the baptism of Christ. This is a public manifestation, the Father saying, this is my Son with whom I am well pleased. So the Father is pronouncing a blessing. He's pronouncing a, a, a success and, and, um, and, and a successful mission that his Son will indeed be faithful. See, that's what Satan's going to challenge throughout the gospel messages or the gospels uh, that we find. He wants to challenge whether Christ really is the faithful Son of God. When the Father makes that declaration of Christ at his baptism, he's saying, this is my son who is going to do my mission. And so that, that water in which John is speaking of, he's speaking of this public manifestation of Christ. So now we take this back into the letter of John. If these people are wrestling with Christ taking on the flesh, well, what is this telling us? John's saying, well, see, my or see the other gospel accounts in this baptism and the significance of the baptism. Well, what's significant about that? Well, he's saying this is where we have Christ, who was born of the Virgin Mary, took on the flesh, God from all eternity, taking on the flesh, the one person, two natures, joining together, uh, going to do his mission, and here is a public declaration of his success. So John's saying, if you doubt that Christ is a God-man, He's saying you need to go back to the Gospels and Christianity 101 and deal with what the Gospels say of this Christ. Read the chapters before that baptism. Read the chapters in, uh, or the chapter of his baptism. What's going on there? It's a public declaration that Christ is the true Son of God from all eternity. And so John is, is driving home to the church that you need to embrace the reality of this, of the Trinitarian God. And so that's the water. But now we think about this blood. 
Because he says, not by water only. Because now people may say, well, yeah, of course we, we believe in that public manifestation. Isn't that where the father adopted the son? Isn't that where the father looked at this one and said, that's a, that's a great son. I'm going to adopt that son. John saying, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Wait a minute. We need to deal with the reality of what this baptism means. It's not just by that baptism. Don't think that's the only testimony we have in the life of Christ to who he is. When he talks about the blood, he's talking about the end point in Christ's mission. So he's basically talking about the public manifestation of Christ on this earth, beginning at the public declaration by the Father, ending in that crucifixion. And so as Christ is die, or dies and, and is crucified, his blood is poured out, what does that end with? Well, that ends with the resurrection of Christ. And so you have a public declaration at the baptism, a public declaration at the crucifixion, resurrection, and all those works um, being basically compounded together in this notion of the blood. So why is John then saying the blood? Well, he wants to emphasize again that Christ took on a true human nature. Again, we'll get into this more in Article 11. But this, this is the driving reality of this, of this truth, that Christ took on a human nature. This is something that's difficult for us to understand. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, one God, three distinct persons, and Christ is definitively a member of this uh, Trinitarian God. He is not created. He is from all eternity. So now when we put this in the context of these three testifying, the water, the spirit, the blood. The spirit endows Christ for his mission. The spirit, as we said, works in terms of the prophetic and apostolic message. The spirit testifies to the truthfulness of the testimony of their tradition. The spirit is also the one uh, who uh, continues or is a member of the Trinity. He's not one who comes into being, he's not an essence of God, but he's a member of the Trinity. The water and the blood testify to who Christ is, that he is the one who is sent by the Father or from God. So then when you go into this testimony and what the Lord is saying, that he does something else that's rather significant, that if we believe in the Son, uh, we have this testimony within ourselves, so we have the objective testimony, it becomes internalized, but we have this reality of who God is, that God is the one who gives eternal life. We have this comparison in verse 9. If we receive the testimony of men, the testimony of God is greater. So what's he doing there? Well, it seems that he's appealing to, I would argue, not only just the, the gospel witness, where you have two or three witnesses, and we have four gospels uh, bearing witness to uh, Christ being the God-man and, and being successful in his mission. But it seems that this witness is throughout the scriptures. And so as he gives this witness, it's what you have in the Old Testament case law. Hey, in terms of the Old Testament case law, how do we do it? Well, we did it by two or three witnesses bearing testimony to this is true. He's saying, well, if we believe the testimony of man, how much more ought we to believe the testimony of God? where he bears testimony of who this son is and the accomplishment of his work. And so again, it's a Trinitarian God working in this reality. And so the, the Trinity then is not just the testimony. The, the Trinity is not the testimony. The testimony is testifying to the truth of the, te of the Trinity. The testimony is testifying to the truth of Christ being the God-man and entering history. And so the reality of this, when John's writing this to the church, he's saying, believe that Christ really did take on the flesh. He didn't appear to be human. He took on our real flesh. Uh, this is a Christ from all eternity, the promised Messiah who enters into history. Uh, the second person of the Trinity has testified at his baptism, confirmed in his resurrection. And then we have the reality of how Christ is the one who accomplishes and confirms the promises of God that this testimony is true. And so the overall point then of what John wants us to understand is that our confidence is not in ourselves. And so this is why when we talk about the water and the blood, 
just referring to the sacraments. I don't think that's necessarily outside the purview of what John's saying, but I don't think that's the primary goal of what he's saying. That what John is primarily saying is here is a public ministry of Christ. As a public ministry of Christ has been accomplished, as you believe the gospel message, as you partake of the sacraments, what are you being identified with? In that public testimony of the living God. But primarily, John's focus here is to drive home the reality that Christ is a God-man sent by the Father to do the Father's will and that the Spirit is the one who testifies to this truth, not only in terms of the baptism equipping him, not only in our believing this testimony through the word, but also the testimony that is given to the prophets and the apostles as they write the scriptures. And so when John gives us his exhortation, and we continue then with that issue of why does this really matter? Why do we really care about this truth? Why is this doctrine of the Trinity so important? When we put in the Belgic Confession, or Guido de Bray, I guess we didn't put it, but when Guido de Bray puts this in a Belgic Confession, he wants to say to Rome that we're Orthodox. We believe in the Orthodox understanding of the living God, even though we, like those before us, do not understand um, who God is and, uh, exhaustively. Now, we know what God has revealed. We know what God has promised. And because of that revelation, we can know God. We just cannot know him exhaustively. And that's what the Belgian Confession is driving home, that we have the doctrine of the Trinity, but we may not understand all the ins and outs of this doctrine. It doesn't negate its reality. It confirms the reality of who we are as an Orthodox Church. And so Guido de Bray wants to drive that point home. So again, if we're not worshiping the true God, then we are not worshiping the true God. And that becomes a fundamental problem. We need to worship the God of Scripture as he has revealed himself to us through his testimony that John is referring to here. And so let us then, as we go forward embracing the substance of the Son of God and we take hold of him by faith, we can be assured that we do this in the power of the Spirit. As the power of the Spirit works within us, cultivating this faith, as we take hold of Christ, why do we take hold of Christ? Because it's the Father who has chosen his people. And there's rich assurance in knowing that reality, that when we know as the Father who has chosen us, Christ has applied his blessings to us. And as the Spirit is the one who cultivates and kindles this life, it's that desire that we continue to walk in that power, finding our life in our Lord, and seeking to die to self and to live unto him as living sacrifices. Let us then continue to do that as we sojourn under the sun. Amen. Thank you for watching or listening to our podcast. Belgrade URC is a Bible-believing, reformed, confessional church that seeks to cultivate community around our Savior. If you desire to learn more about Christianity, Please join us for worship each Sunday at 10 a.m. and 6 p.m. If you're not able to attend church, you can tune in to our Sunday live stream through our YouTube channel. Please subscribe to our current sermon series and weekly meditation through iTunes or your favorite podcast catcher. If we are not listed on your favorite podcasting host, please let us know through our webpage, URCBEL g-r-a-d-e dot com. You can also utilize our archive sermon series on our website urcbelgrade.com. Most of all, we hope to see you sojourning and fellowshipping with us each Sunday. Until we meet again, may the Lord's blessing and peace be upon you.